Well, I see that it is 12.02, so I will let folks keep adding in the chat kind of where, where you're from, maybe your first name as well, um, but I'll go ahead and get started with, with some introductions here. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maya Swope, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Very excited that you all are joining us for this Lunch with the Friends webinar presentation. Um, excited to have Brian Hansel here, who has some great photography tips, is kind of a Boundary Waters and North Shore expert, um, and so knows a lot of, a lot of great things um, to, to help all of you with some photography, with some gear, things like that. Um, a couple of things before we get started, um, just a little bit of background about Friends of the Boundary Waters. We have been around for more than 40 years, working to protect wilderness, protect clean water um, in the Boundary Waters and the surrounding ecosystem. And today our work really focuses on three different areas, the first of which is wilderness. So working directly to protect the wilderness area that all of us care so much about. Um, we also recognize that community is really important. So the communities that are at the gateway to the Boundary Waters are essential to keeping Northern Minnesota healthy and thriving. Um, and we are working to support um, enriching and strengthening the economies up there. Um, we also recognize that people are really important to the Boundary Waters and to our environmental initiatives more broadly. Um, we have programs like No Boundaries to the Boundary Waters, which brings kids from across the state up to the Boundary Waters and helps teach people canoeing and things like that. Um, and we really just wanna recognize that, yeah, people, Boundary Waters, communities are all intertwined and that really is kind of the mission of our organization. Um, I will get started in just a minute here, um, but wanted to just point out a few Zoom features. We do have a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and add those to the Q&A um, and we will try to get to those at the end. Um, we also have a chat function. So if you have any technical issues or any just general comments throughout, um, please feel free to send me a message on that and we can try to get everything sorted out. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any trouble hearing or anything like that, please add that to the chat as well. Um, I wanna go ahead and introduce Brian Hansel. Um, he's been a wonderful supporter of Friends of the Boundary Waters and a great environmental educator, advocate for wilderness and a resident of the North Shore. Um, he's also an expert photographer, has logged lots and lots of time in the wilderness on his own trips. Um, and has a lot of great advice for, for all of us today. So Brian, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, appreciate it. So thanks everybody for coming today. Um, let's get uh, started here. So I'm just gonna share my screen for everybody. All right, so today's talk is um, Capturing the Wilderness, Canoe and Kayak Photography Tips. And this photo, I just, uh, I just added this today, this morning, and uh, it's from my recent trip. So I actually just followed um, the route, the 1879 route of Minnesota state geologist, Newton Horace Winchell, and this was on the trip. So this is just a lake, just slightly outside the boundary waters. It's called Crescent. Uh, had a beautiful moon set on the morning. So uh, what we're gonna cover today is um, the process that I go through of figuring out what gear I'm gonna carry, uh, but also like how to protect your gear and how to take some pretty cool shots. Uh, it will cover kayak and canoe photography and it isn't specific to any one location. It's just kind of a general consideration. Most of the photos here in this presentation are gonna be shown or, or shot in Cook County or the Boundary Waters uh, area, uh, but you might see some from elsewhere. So before you um, head out on the trip, like the most, I think, think the most important question you need to ask yourself is what kind of shots do you wanna get? Because determining what kind of shots you wanna get while you're on the water determines the kind of gear that you should bring and also determines how you should carry it. So if you're looking to get kind of candid shots of your family or, or wildlife or whatever, it's gonna be a different type of gear than um, 
what you would do to do like a landscape shot. Uh, if you have paddlers with you that are willing to pose on the water, and you're, you're gonna see a lot of pictures of my kid. This, this is my kid right here. Um, then, then it's gonna be a little bit different camera gear than, than trying to bring or trying to get the, uh, you know, candid shots versus pose shots. And both these two shots up in the, the upper left of the screen right now, these are pose shots. So my kid uh, was looking like a little guide, I thought, um, with his NRS uh, Patagonia hat and checkered shorts. So that's like your typical uh, whitewater rafting guide wear there. So I thought that would be a good shot. And these are my uh, friends and some of you may know I'm Dave and Amy Freeman and we were on a trip through the Boundary Waters. And if you've ever come down uh, the Pigeon River heading to the Grand Portage, you know that you don't you don't really portage into this area, but we thought it would be a really cool shot. Um, so we portaged down here and had them paddle back and forth through this section so that we could get the shot. Uh, and hopefully you end this up on a cover of a magazine, which it did, it was National Parks Traveler cover uh, is where that ended up. But um, the reason you don't do this is because there's white water down there, but they were willing to pose and, we're, and I had the gear to take advantage of that. So, you know, the first thing, are you willing to wait for the light and pose the shot? Because if you are, you might pick something up a little bit different or pick a different camera system. Um, if you're not, then maybe you're not gonna haul as much gear. You know, if you want to be able to capture the moments when they pop up, you're going to need a camera that's kind of uh, quick to get to, handy, that's always at hand. Um, and this is just going to help you select that gear. So uh, we'll just cover a few strategies for several different scenarios that occur on like a Boundary Waters trip or a, or a paddling trip on the Great Lakes or even the ocean. So this is for the candid shot. So it's kind of the pictures of paddling partners, portages and partridges. And just to, to see what I, or just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, you know, something, something like this, uh, you know, your, your paddling partner underneath a waterfall on Lake Superior. Um, or a calm day on Lake Superior, just paddling. So it's kind of just whip out a camera, take a shot of it real quick. You don't have to have the most excellent camera gear to get that shot and have it look good on social media. Um, this is my wife. Uh, we had landed on this beach looking for a rare gemstone. Uh, we found one um, that was worth about a hundred bucks. Uh, and as you can see, my wife's pretty happy. She just wanted to grab that candid kind of shot. Portaging is very, very difficult to take pictures of, mainly because you don't want to be messing around with a camera while you're portaging. So it's nice to include portaging into kind of these candid, candid shots. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of a partridge. Uh, it fit the rhyme, but I'm going with moose picture instead. So um, the desirable kind of camera features that you want um, are easy to access, small, waterproof, can take a polarizer, and then for wildlife, you're gonna need a, a long lens. And uh, this picture here, if anybody is a Lundy fan, um, Lundy's an architect from Minnesota. He built, these are two of his houses here on Lake Superior. So by easy to access, uh, for me, I always like small cameras that fit into a very small case. So this whole case is pocketable. I can put it in my, pockets that I normally wear in my pants and carry it across a portage and get to it very quickly. Uh, sometimes I don't even bother to put it in the case. This isn't a waterproof camera, but I'll just put the camera in my pocket and uh, I'm just not gonna fall out of my canoe and get wet. It just doesn't, it's not probably gonna happen. It's probably not gonna happen to you either. Um, so putting a camera, a small pocketable camera in your pocket uh, works pretty well. Here's an example of something that's not very easy to access. So this is one of the best dry bags for photography out there. It's made by Watershed, uh, but it takes multiple latches and a special closure system to get it in and out. It's completely waterproof, but it takes a while to get your camera out of there. Another nice feature for this kind of category is a small camera. So this is just a, a small Nikon interchangeable lens camera very small. And then here's an example of not so small. So we run into these kind of situations with this category where you want to get pictures of wildlife, but you need a long lens, which isn't easy to handle in your canoe. What I end up doing is I just set my canoe on the ground or I just set my camera on the floor of the canoe and um, uh, shoot that way when I'm shooting with a big lens. Waterproof is really nice to have. Uh, because you get to some situations where you 
wouldn't be able to get the picture if the camera wasn't waterproof. So this is right after ice out on Lake Superior and we're horsing around in the harbor, landing on ice chunks, diving into the freezing water. We all have uh, dry suits on, so we're, we're nice and warm and safe. Uh, but I probably wouldn't have hauled a camera out for this because we were falling in and we were purposely falling in uh, just to have fun in the ice. Uh, so having that waterproof camera that's tethered to your life vest makes it really easy to get these kind of shots. And then also with the waterproof cameras, you can get these over under shots where you can see underneath the water and still see the paddler on top. A polarizer uh, attachment on this kind of camera can be nice, especially midday. So this is a shot on the left um, where I'm using a polarizer and you can see how blue the sky becomes. That's the polarizer. A polarizer is just a filter and it just um, intensifies colors, makes the sky blue and removes reflections. So on the water, you can barely see any reflections. And then you notice how my family's clothing is very bright and the greens are very bright. When you look over on the right-hand side, the, the colors aren't as saturated, there's more reflections and it looks a lot more harsh, like a midday harsh sunlight versus the blue over there. For me, it's not a, it's not a uh, deal breaker uh, if I don't have a polarizer attachment on my candid camera, but it's kind of nice to have. So except for wildlife, um, the best kind of cameras here are ones that are easy to grab. And what most of us have now is we have a camera on our cell phone. So something like a Google Pixel that's waterproof, that's um, uh, easy to grab, easy to use. And uh, for one trip last year or the year before, I can't remember what year it was, all I shot with was a Google Pixel for when we were on the move. At sunrise and sunset, I brought out my um, uh, better camera, but it takes good pictures. So cell phones nowadays take good pictures. And this was an older, this is a Google Pixel 3. Uh, the new iPhones and the new Pixels are amazing, uh, even compared to what you get here. And it was raining. I don't know if anybody can tell, but it's raining in this picture. And because it's a waterproof phone, it doesn't matter. Just pull it out. And these are all candid shots of my family that I took while I was on that, that shot and I, or on that um, trip. And I got quite a bit of them. Another nice thing about cell phone shots is you can do the panoramic. This panoramic view is just built in. You just switch into the panoramic mode and you rotate your camera and it takes this nice sweeping view of a panoramic shot. And then if you're uh, getting a little bit uh, over the hill, the nice thing about um, nice thing about cell phones is when you turn on the selfie, they smooth out your skin. So <laughs> bye bye wrinkles. Uh, it looks a little plastic and fake to me, but uh, you know you can do it. And they do fairly decent at sunrise and sunset. So this is a handheld shot with the Google Pixel. Uh, pretty good. Here's a version of that shot shot with uh, my normal camera, which is considerably more expensive than a Google Pixel. Uh, but when you go between the two, um, yeah, this is better. You can see more details in the shadows and this more accurate color probably. The color doesn't look quite, I mean, this yellow does ne it never, you never see that yellow in real life. Uh, so the pixels off a little bit there, but you know, if that's all you have, it does pretty decent. And I'll give you just a second to look at these pictures and make up your own mind on which one's the Pixels, uh, can't, Pixel, Google Pixel, which was a $600 camera, and which is my um, $3,000 camera with $1,500 lens. Pixel does pretty well. It's the one on the right is the Pixel. And then uh, my real camera is the one on the left. Now, uh, I did have a problem when I did this experiment. And I think it goes back to Aldo Leopold and something he wrote in San County Almanac. And he wrote, recreation is valuable in proportion to the intensity of its experiences and to the degree in which it differs from and contrasts with workaday life. So my problem was I found that the cell phone was of my workaday life. So it was distracting from the trip and it felt like the trip was less wildernessly and less valuable as a getaway for me. So I decided that I'm not gonna use a cell phone on uh, to photograph my trips. Uh, that might not be the same for you, but it, it certainly affected the way that I do trips. So I, I won't do that again. Um, so what I carry instead are some small point and shoots. My favorite is a Ricoh GR3 or the Sony RX100s. Uh, they fit in your palm. The RX100, you can get a complete waterproof dive case for. 
Um, and then I don't have the Sony RX10. I have a friend, multiple friends that have this camera and I'll show you a picture that they got out of it. It's really cool, it fits in your palm and it goes from 24 millimeters to 600. So from wide angle to telephoto. Here's a few shots that I've taken with the Sony RX100 cameras. Um, so this is Rendezvous Days up in Grand Portage, which is in August, if you've never gone, you should. About uh, 200 reenactors fur trader reenactors come to uh, Grand Portage and put up tents and then the tribe is running their powwow at the same time. So it's a really fun festival. Uh, here's the, I have that waterproof case on that RX100, does pretty cool stuff. Um, and it does have a panoramic mode built in. So it's a very similar feature to what you'd have on your cell phone. Here's an example of that RX-10. So that's the 24 to 600. So my friend, Paul Sundberg, who um, just lives down the street from me, he was out paddling a kayak one day on a local lake and saw this loon and loon chick. He has this camera that fits into the palm of his hand and he was able to zoom in and take this shot without disturbing them at all. Um, you're gonna pay for that. It's, it's, it's a pretty expensive point and shoot camera, but it does have a lot of versatility. My favorite one is the Ricoh GR3. Um, it has a fixed focal length, which is similar to the same way that your phone operates. You only, you only get one choice usually, but it can take some seriously good images. So I have a YouTube video all about this camera and using it for landscapes. If you're interested, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is just YouTube, um, youtube.com slash Brian Hansel. But here's a few shots taken with that uh, camera. And I could, like I said, it does a really good job um, doing it. Some people use action cameras in this category. I have a lot of action cameras. Um, I do use them this way, as particularly for this point of view type of shot. I really enjoy this, this look that action cameras give you. So this is my personal fleet of action cameras. Um, and then you, because they're so small, I always put some kind of float on them. This is like a floatable selfie stick and these are just various handles. Uh, but it's nice just in case that, that they get out of hand. The problem is distortion and noise. So I'm just gonna zoom in right here. If you can see um, how uh, the noise, so this graininess in the background, and that's causing the lighthouse to look less sharp. So as the light gets lower, you lose, um, you just lose uh, the sharpness and the cleanness of the image. Uh, over here, you can see the horizon is curved. So most of these lenses on action cameras give this curve that needs to be correction, corrected. And you can see, you'd have to take it into software to correct that. I'll just go back and forth. If you look at the image on the right, you can see the correction. Now, one of the fun things about action cameras are the new 360 degree action cameras, because you can turn, you can make some pretty wild videos. <laughs> like here we are uh, paddling on a little planet, um, <laughs> just shot with an action camera and they disappear from view. So the way the, act, the 360 cameras uh, work is they'll take a picture that's 360, 180 degrees around you. And um, then it just completely disappears from view. You don't even see the camera in the shot. So the other option in this category is small interchangeable lens camera. So this is a Nikon Z50, but like a Sony um, 6000 series camera would be equivalent size. And these are also take great pictures. So small and good pictures. And this is, a, this is my kid's solo paddling when he was five. Here's what it looks like, uh, all the cameras together. So this would be that Sony, that Sony RX100. Here's that Ricoh, here's that Nikon Z50. And then this is a, uh, the, my main professional camera. You can see how much smaller these others are compared to it. So if you're working more on cameras for quality and campsites, you know, the kind of shots, sunrise, sunsets, plan shots, any kind of night images, you know, something like this, where you're gonna wake up early to get this kind of shot this time of year, you're gonna wake up at like 4.15 in the morning and get a five o'clock sunrise. Um, it, it's a slightly different camera. So you want something more capable, um, especially if you're just gonna go with, you know, if you're willing to work with the best light, send your partner out to paddle late in the evening instead of sitting by the campfire. And you need top quality uh, because you're gonna either blow it up big for your wall or you're publishing for magazines or prints or whatever, or anytime you wanna shoot night photography, like this was a, a great, 
event that we had in the Boundary Waters on one of our trips a couple of years ago. It went on all night like this. It was absolutely beautiful. So kind of camera equipment that you want for that is something with high image quality, versatility, and can use filters. The high image quality generally means a full frame, although you could get a crop sensor. Um, it also means you want an interchangeable lens. That way you can pick the lens for the picture. Um, and versatile, versatility just uh, is that interchangeable lens uh, system, so multiple lenses. And then can you use filters. I'm a big filter user, so I'm a Singray ambassador. They're a company out of Florida. They make all their filters um, in the U.S. And uh, because you came to one of my presentations, you qualify for a 10% discount if you buy direct from Singray.com. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can just uh, use the code that Hansel for that one. So interchangeable lenses, multiple lenses, and the ability to use filters. And I'll just show you when I'm going on a Boundary Waters photo trip or a kayak photo trip, this is the gear that I bring. I bring a lot of it. So I have multiple lenses here. Uh, these are filters in these two cases, a lot of batteries, cleaning equipment, uh, a tripod, although I use a lighter tripod. This is a five pound tripod that you're seeing here in the picture. I have a three pound that I use now. And then like a, and two bodies. So in case one um, malfunctions, I definitely want to back up with me because I don't want to miss out on those kind of shots. And then uh, extension tubes I list here, if I'm going to shoot uh, any flowers or mushrooms or close up stuff, it's a good way to avoid bringing in a macro lens, which a, a specific macro lens would just be for close ups, but you can turn any lens into a close up lens with extension tubes. So that's kind of fun to have. Here's the kind of filters that I bring. Um, so I'm going to bring a solid ND. This is for blurring the motion of water. Uh, polarizer, either a waterfall polarizer or a regular polarizer, some kind of filter holder. And then split um, filters. So with the split filters, you put the dark part over the sky and the clear part over the, the ground. And it evens out the exposure between sunrise and sunset. So you can get a bright foreground uh, with a dark sky, which I'll show you what that looks like in the, in the next picture here. So actually put that filter right along the horizon. So the dark part um, is over the sky and the clear part is over the ground. Um, so you can get detail in the canoe and the paddler and all that stuff. So it works pretty well. So those are kind of the choices that you're gonna make uh, camera gear. Um, and, and it's a, you know, you, you often think that maybe you could just bring it all, but when you bring it all, it's really heavy. So uh, I just got done with that trip, uh, which was 160 miles with about 30 miles of portaging. And I really didn't wanna carry this full kit because this full kit is about 25 pounds total. So I had to decide what I was gonna pare it down to and ended up with about 10 pounds of gear uh, instead of the 25 pounds. It makes a difference just on what you're doing and what kind of pictures you think you're gonna capture. So after you decide on equipment, what you end up do, doing is moving into how to carry your gear. So there's basically two choices that you have, soft cases or hard cases. Um, and I personally like the soft cases myself, but I'm gonna show you both of them. And this one, this picture I didn't take, my wife took this picture. This is actually me um, out paddling that day. It was kind of a fun, fun wavy day. So here's a, you know, by soft cases, I mean stuff like this, which would be, you know, dry bag. And then I put an old um, foam mattress cut to the inside of this to protect the camera. Uh, th this works really well. Uh, hard cases, Pelican cases make the best ones. Um, so if you have a lot of gear to carry, you can bring a big one. If you just have a small camera, you can bring another one. A different type of soft case is one that has an optical port. So you can stick the camera in there and still shoot through that optical port. Dry bags are gonna work best when you're dealing with kayaks. So if you're doing any kayaking, don't even attempt a hard case. They don't fit inside, they're a hassle to use. When they're up on your deck, if you have a surf landing, you're gonna, they're gonna fall off your deck and it's just gonna be a big yard sale on the surf. Um, so just do like a dry bag and stuff it inside the day hatch or something. Hard cases work fairly decent for canoeing. Um, you can. They're easy to access, so you just unclip this uh, snap and then your camera gear comes out instantly. Uh, the bigger ones, you can carry multiple lenses in. 
smaller ones, you can just carry one small camera in. The problem is Portigene with these hard cases. They're heavy, they don't fit in a pack very well. You can carry them across in your hand, which is what I would typically do, but because they're heavier and bulky, uh, they just, for me, they just don't work very well. I would rather carry a soft case. And this, um, this soft case is Watershed. And I have a, if you wanna see my review on this, you can go to my uh, paddling website, which is paddlinglight.com. Um, it's my choice has a padded insert and then I'll just show you. So this is that gear shot that I showed earlier. Here's that gear packed up inside of that bag. So all of this gear, uh, except for the tripod, fits into this duffel and you can see the padding, it's standard camera padding that Velcros and you can rearrange it to, to move your gear all around. And when it's packed up, it gets, gets down to this big, um, and we, you, I can stick this in my pack if I want to, but generally I just carry it across the portage. Um, uh, or my paddling partner, which is usually my wife, uh, she'll be portaging our pack and, and she'll carry this in a hand and I'll, I'll do a canoe in another pack. Um, so yeah, they both have their uses, but I, I would definitely lean towards the soft cases for almost every usage and then small hard cases if you have a small point and shoot just because they're so much easier to get in and out of. So now we got a few tips here um, for taking photos and this is my attempt at a humorous pun. So tips for taking photos, how to cook a photo and then there's cooking gear. I, I know you're all cracking up at home about that, that joke. So if you only use, so, so what I'm gonna cover here is just like one style of composition because it works really well for the boundary waters and paddling and seascapes and where you have any water or, or whatever, it works, uh, it works fantastic. And this, this style is called near-far composition. So what you do with near-far composition is you put something cool right in front of you so I'm basically standing right at the bottom of the shot. My tripod is just out of the shot here. And then you put something cool in the background and somehow you relate those two things together. So in this shot, the color of the sunrise is reflected in the yellows of reds of the fall colors of the bushes here. And these bushes uh, form like this line that leads your eyes out to that sun. Um, so we have that connection. We also have the sunlight splashing back on the rock and the leaves, so we're connecting it that way. That's called a relationship. The more of those relationships or the more of those connections you can build, the stronger your shot's going to be. And I'll just show examples of how to set something like this up. So here's the shot, uh, the final shot of this, and you can see um, the composition. Basically, my tripod leg is just right out of the screen or right out of the shot right there. And you'll notice that the camera is tilted downward and I'm using a wide angle lens. So I'm using 14 millimeters on this and it distorts the foreground and makes it look bigger um, and more attractive to your eye. Here's another example. Um, so if we go over here, if you look at this tripod, uh, the legs are right here, which in the shot would be exactly about right here. So if you look and you see that this little dimple on the rock, that's this dimple right here. So the tripod is very, very close to the front of the shot. And in order to make it work, that camera is angled downward again. Um, and that emphasizes that foreground. And in this case, we have that line. It, this crack works as a line to lead your eyes out to the horizon. Canoes, kayaks, whatever, also work really well as lines to lead viewers' eyes out to the horizon. And when you do that, it builds depth, the three-dimensional depth, depth into your image. So the key here is get the camera down low, maybe waist level, get right over your subject and then tilt it. Here's an example of those ND grad filters that I mentioned earlier. This is the holder on, on my lens. Um, it's split right here. The clear part is down below, the dark part is up above. Usually when we're taking a picture out there, we either get something like this, um, where you have detail in the foreground and the sky is blown out, or you can have detail in the sky and the foreground uh, goes black. So if you've ever had that, raise your hand right now. Um, I know I have, but with that filter, you can just put it right here, the dark part over the sky, and it evens that exposure out uh, and makes it uh, quite a bit e more even across the whole scene. So it's sort of a combination of these two shots where we can see detail in the foreground and de detail in the background. 
this is also one of those near far shots. So we have this old um, uh, T. Ballard in the Grand Marais Harbor. This is where the America used to dock uh, in the 30s and I think 20s as well, uh, right up until the 30s when I believe it sunk on Isle Royal somewhere around uh, the 30s. So that's our near and our far is the sunset going on over the hills. Uh, it's kind of formulaic as far as settings on these things. So F11 to F16 would be our setting, our lowest ISO that our camera can do. And we're gonna focus right on this spot. As long as you're shooting wide angle, which is 35 millimeters and wider on a full frame camera, um, and your waist, or waist to chest high or higher, if you focus on that bottom third, like if you were to draw a line right across the bottom third, if you focus anywhere on there, it's gonna give you everything in focus from the foreground all the way to the background in the shot. But how to place those uh, ND filters. So here's the example shot. Again, a near far shot, canoe leading out to the horizon. We want that filter to go right over, um, right at the horizon. So this, if this is where it was uh, on our camera, we would wanna raise that up. We'd wanna raise it up until you get to this point. So you can see how that, that hard transition line is right at the horizon. The dark part of the filter is darkening down the sky so that you can get detail on your foreground so that we can actually see um, the canoe in this shot. So here's that settings again. So the way that I shoot this is um, aperture priority. My f-stop is gonna be f11 to f16. And then I'm gonna use the lowest ISO that I have. And then the shutter speed, wherever it ends up is where it ends up. If I need a faster um, shutter speed to stop action, let's say I wanna get some waves, I wanna stop the action of some waves, I'm gonna raise the ISO up until I get a fast enough shutter speed. If I need a slower shutter speed, then that's when you add one of those solid ND filters. So in this case, I put a five stop solid ND filter on. There was a little bit of water, uh, wind blowing across. This is uh, Winchell. Uh, in the boundary waters, a little wind blown across and, and there were a little bit of waves, but the long exposure smoothed that out and made it look nice and calm, which I like the contrast of that to the stormy sky. So for me, the classic kind of canoe or kayak at sunrise or sunset shot is uh, what I love to take a picture of. Almost every sunrise or sunset in the boundary waters, if I have a good good view of the sunrise or sunset, I'm gonna throw my canoe or kayak into it just because that's it's what I like to do. Um, if you think about it, it's just a near far shot with a boat in it. So we have the boat working as our near and then the back uh, drop, which will be tree lines in the boundary waters um, or hillsides uh, and sunset. You're gonna use that ND filter the same way. And then when you set up, you just set up with your tripod almost directly over the bow. Um, and then the tripod height would be waist to chest level. And I'll show you the difference in the look. Um, this shot right here, it's chest to eye level and you can see more of the top of the boat. When you drop it down to waist level, you get more of the side of the boat um, shown. So, and I just, I have to pause with this shot because this is my canoe, uh, how it looked last year without a, hardly any scratches on it. And after this recent 160 mile trip I did, it's, it's scratched to crazy. There was a mile and a half of white water on it that I had a line down and, uh, on the Poplar River and it's, uh, it's now scratched to heck. Uh, there's a lot of scratches on the sides from bushwhacking it and pulling it and pushing it through the woods behind me. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, this is a waist level, but you get more of a side shot uh, to the image. So here's a, a higher shot again, and then the, we're using the kayak here to lead your eyes out to the horizon. So it builds depth into the shot, but that's that classic canoe and kayak shot where you're using that canoe to lead the viewer's eyes out to the horizon. Also like to do night shots um, with the canoes or just night shots in general. And there's a little bit of, uh, you have to make some decisions on um, what kind of gear you're gonna bring. It's gonna be heavier because you're gonna need a faster lens. So you want a lens that can go to F2.8 at minimum. If you can bring F1.8 or F1.4, it's even better. Uh, and you're gonna use an ISO of 32 to 6400, the biggest sensor camera that you can bring. So like a full frame camera, although crop sensors work just fine. 
And then generally you do these uh, 15 to 30 second long exposures. There's a formula you can use. The number of seconds that you're gonna keep it over is uh, 500 divided by the focal length. Um, and that will give you, so you take 500, you divide it by whatever your focal length is, and that gives you the number of seconds to leave your shutter open. Um, yeah, I think it's great if you can get, you know, I don't know if everybody heard the news, but uh, the Boundary Waters last year received an International Dark Sky Sanctuary designation because it is one of the darkest spots in the world. Uh, in Cook County, at the end of the Gunflint Trail, we have what's called a Bordel Level 1. Level 1 is equal to some of the darkest places in the world, so it's incredibly dark up there. You can see the Milky Way with your eyes, and I just think it's a great thing to bring to bring a camera along with you uh, to try to photograph the night sky. In this one, um, I'm using an off-camera light to light up the foreground so you can see the canoe. Here's another example of uh, some northern lights over a lake, and this is a selfie. Uh, I actually paddled out here, and the reason I'm not blurry is because it was quite shallow here, so I was able to push my um, uh, canoe paddle down to the floor of the lake and hold my position, and then I just had the camera take shot after shot after shot, and a couple of them I was completely still and sharpened, so that was pretty fun to be able to get that. We do get northern lights more often than people would think. Right now, we're a we're coming out of the solar minimum, so in the next couple of years, we'll be getting even more northern lights. Uh, but if you're out around midnight, you can sometimes get surprise northern lights that aren't even predicted to happen. So it's worth, if you're into night sky and northern lights and stuff, it's worth on your trip to the Boundary Waters getting a campsite with a northern view and waking up at about 11.30 and staying out until about 12.30 to see if you get some surprise northern lights. The downside to that strategy is the Milky Way is in the southern sky, so you want to get a campsite on the north side of a lake so you can see the Milky Way. Also like to do night shots, um, you know, in the blue hour. The blue hour is about 45 minutes after sunset. It lasts about a half hour. Everything turns deep blue like this. This isn't a trick of the camera. It's just a natural occurrence. And this is a full moon lighting up the water. And it's also an example of modern camera technology. So this is using vibration reduction. I'm hand holding this off of a tripod in my canoe at about an eighth of a second. In the past, like before the vibration reduction technology was available, you'd probably end up with a pretty blurry shot or need to take 20 or 30 shots to get one that was sharp. Nowadays, with that kind of stability, it's just tack sharp in your first shot. Kind of the classic other shot um, to get is your tent, tent at night shot. Uh, and the way that you do this is you expose for the sky and then you light for the ground. So in this instance, there's actually a campfire down here lighting up this cliff face. And I, if I remember right, this is about 100, 150 feet cliff right here. We put one small light in the tent, just like a LED tea um, candle light, just a single one in the tent to light the tent. And then you're looking over at a cliff right on the opposite side that this is a, this is a thousand foot cliff. This is, um, I, I, we definitely didn't camp in Mexico. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, anyways, this is Mexico. That's the U.S. And the, the Rio Grande runs right um, through this section. So this is down on the Rio Grande. So the settings um, for Milky Way and the tent light shots, it's kind of the same as night shots. You're just gonna put a small LED inside of your tent and then you're just gonna change the brightness of the LED until it uh, brightens up your tent enough or and doesn't overexpose. So sometimes even these small little um, candles or the candle LED bulbs, they can be too bright. So then you just take like a, a napkin or something, uh, a piece of paper and you put it over it and it dims it down enough so that you can um, get detail in your tent and it doesn't blow it out. And no, uh, I, I don't know if anybody's on Instagram and follows the account that's called You Did Not Camp There. <laughs> this would be the perfect poster child for that because I'm standing, so this is a selfie, I'm standing on a cliff 200 feet above a lake and I did not camp there. I put the tent there uh, just for the picture. Here's another example of that uh, kind of shot. So then, um, you know, the, 
in the canoe or kayak shots, these are really fun because you can get pictures of your partners. I like this bow shot. I know it's a little cliche, but I'm still going to take it because I like it. Uh, the key to this thing is you just need a fast enough shutter speed to stop any action. So the shutter speed of 1 250th of a second or above uh, works out pretty well. When I'm shooting this, I turn on auto ISO on my camera, and then it's set. It's designed to get me around this shutter speed to stop the action. Here's just a few shots of, um, you know, the on the move kind of bow of the boat shot. Um, you can tell here that my kid is really bored <laughs> with me taking his picture. So by this, five, I think we're on day five or six of this trip. And every time I would ask him to take his picture, he would just give me this face uh, by that point in the trip. Uh, this is down at Teddy State Park, uh, going through the kayak or the caves in winter, um, Junko River harbor this is down in iowa during a flood i this ended up in sea kayaker magazine back when that was um published shooting paddle uh, paddling partners is also important on your trip to uh not only to give them pictures but also if you're ever going to share your trip with anybody uh we like to see what what our partners are doing or what other people are doing on the trips instead of just landscape so um it's going to be the kind of the same settings where you want a fast shutter speed to stop action as you would with the canoe and kayak shots. And then I think like there's two ways to take it. You either fill the frame um, with your paddling partners and whatever action is going on. So in this case, you know, we're hoisting the American flag on this island that we took over in uh, Grand Marais, Michigan uh, at the Sea Kayaking Symposium over there. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that there wasn't much space around the action uh, because that would detract from the action. So by making the action fill the entire frame, you you force your viewers' eyes to look at that. And no, we didn't actually take an American flag and put it on my kayak. There's actually a flag pole that you can see right there. Uh, we just made it look like it was on my kayak. The other way is um, showing your your paddlers in context, and I'll show you a few pictures. Of that but this is kind of that zoomed in shot so this is my wife we're down in the gulf of mexico um and we're doing some navigation so i wanted to get a cool picture up close showing our chart uh, the compass and uh, my wife finding our course um so by doing it, i just i just, i went wide and got basically leaned right on the front of her boat and took this wide angle shot um but had her fill that frame same is true here. So this is down on the Zumbro, uh, I think the north branch of the Zumbro River a couple years ago. Um, and this is Jerry Vandiver uh, paddling. So I just zoomed in on him to and filled the whole frame with the canoe. Uh, you'll notice that there's a little bit of space over on this side versus this side. And I do that on purpose because it gives your paddler some place to paddle into. If you take the canoe and you put the side of the shot right up against the canoe it looks a little strange and your viewer will be unnerved by it because they don't know where that canoe is going so try to put a little bit of space in front of the canoe and where they're going so you can see here this is down in the florida keys dave and amy freeman um we were on joined them for the end of one of the trips that they did but you can see that they have this space that they can paddle into and that's that i think seven mile bridge i think that's what they call that thing we saw a huge shark in this area. It was amazing. I paddled right over it. Uh, here's another couple examples. So this is down on the Rio Grande, um, close up showing us lining around the, um, the white water. And here's the, the, taking your paddling partner and just putting them in perspective in the shot. So this is an important shot so that people can see what the terrain was like when you're going through it. So here's thousand foot cliffs in Mexico and here's the tiny tiny little boat paddling some rapids uh, next to the cliffs. Those are great shots to have, just your paddling partner um, in the scene. Here's another one of those uh, shots, just framing up the tiny little canoe on the river type of a shot. And um, it's also fun getting your paddling partners taking, uh, doing something like here's some action uh, going on. And the reason I took this shot is because when they were, uh, when they were packing the, the gear here, when they're packing the oatmeal, they did it in the office in their factory. So this is at the North, these, uh, this is Charlie and Bear who works at North Star Canoe. And they had packed up all this uh, oatmeal in the office and it, it got the flavor of uh, canoe resin. So it was a specially flavored oatmeal. So I wanted to mark the, uh, 
know, I want to make sure we had a shot of that so we could always remember how awesome that that boat flavored oatmeal was. And uh, so so I just zoomed way in on it so you can see Charlie uh, stirring the stirring the pot there and, uh, you know, bear in the background. So yeah, we'll get to questions here in a second, but I just want to um, thank, uh, uh, I was a creative support individual grant awardee from the Minnesota Arts Board and that helped um, make this presentation uh, possible. So I um, also want to thank North Star and Sing Ray Canoes, which are a few of my sponsors. And then if you're interested in learning more about what I do, so primarily I am a landscape photographer. I sell landscape work and artwork and prints and all that stuff. But primarily how I earn my income is through photography workshops. So if you want to uh, learn photography, I teach those uh, not only on the North Shore out of Grand Marais, but all across the country uh, as well at various national parks. Like, for example, uh, this year, I'll be out in Death Valley, the Badlands Black Hills. Next spring, I'm out in the Smokies, a few other spots. Um, and then I also blog at paddlinglight.com. So if you're into paddling, you can check out that blog. Uh, I try to post an article every week. And right now, I'm doing gear lists for my last trip in the Boundary Water. So if you want to see what gear I hauled along on that 160-mile trip and see everything that I portaged 30 miles uh, with, you can check that out. And then, um, yeah, so let's uh, get to some questions here. Great. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I'll just also encourage folks to go to our Friends of the Boundary Waters website, which is up on the screen there. Um, and we've got some route suggestions, some other gear suggestions, nothing specific to photography, but some general um, things to know for Boundary Waters trips, as well as a lot of information about how you can help in the fight to protect the boundary waters and to keep this wilderness wild and clean. Um, I will just put a reminder in for folks to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and I will start kind of just reading out some of the things that I'm seeing here um, that people are asking about. Um, I will start with a couple of gear questions. Um, somebody is wondering, do you have a recommendation for a waterproof case for an iPhone? Um, someone who wants to use their phone camera and wants, you know, to, to feel good about bringing that into the water. Um, I, I think you're probably fine on almost anything out there that's reasonably priced, but I know like Seattle Sports and Seal Line make some, um, and then Aquapack also makes some that are, that would be decent quality and, I would trust putting my phone in. Um, but, you know, there's so many manufacturers out there now. I would just find one that is based in the, U I mean, personally for me, made in the USA or based in the USA is important. So that's what I'm going to buy from. So I would find whatever company meets that. And, um, you know, a lot of the, as long as you go with a major outdoor brand, I think you're probably going to end up with a decent, um, decent holder. Um, another kind of gear question, Greg is wondering what extension tubes do you like to use? So uh, right now I'm using the Nikon Z system, which is their new interchangeable lens mirrorless camera system. And there's only one maker out there <laughs> of it. So that was my choice. And I, I think if I remember right, it was uh, the brand is Miki or something, M-E-K-E. -E. Uh, but the kind of the standard in extension tubes is Kenco. If you, if they make them for your system, that you might as well just go with those because those are the best. Great. Um, I see Fred is wondering um, how could I choose and get started with the split filter idea. I do a lot of sunrises and would love to try that. Yeah. So if you. Um, my website has like some blog articles on it. So if you go to brianhansel.com, you can see my recommendations. But for the boundary waters, like if it's boundary water specific, there's uh, three filters that I would bring with me. And one, it would be a three-stop reverse. Um, and I use Singray filters, but these are available from other manufacturers as well. But I would do a three-stop reverse. And then I would do um, a four-stop all-in-one filter. And that's a filter that I actually designed with Singray. So it's only currently available from Singray until another company decides to, you know, basically take the design and make it themselves. And then I would bring a three-stop soft filter. 
Um, if I had to just pick one, I would probably pick a three stop reverse because that's going to work anywhere there's water on the horizon, like over a lake, over the sea, over the Great Lake, something like that. And then you'll need a filter holder um, for that. There's a bunch of different brands out there and they all have issues. <laughs> so um, the cheapest one, I forget how to, uh, uh, I think it's Sioti or Sioti or something like that. S-I-O-T-T-I -T -T -I, um, is the brand of filter holders. You can pick that up for about 30 bucks and it's, it, it has issues, but it has very limited number of issues. And it's for the price at 30 bucks is a good thing to experiment with. Okay. Um, let's see, got a few more questions in here. Um, a couple of people wondering about tripods, like what tripod you use. Somebody asking, are you pleased with your three pound tripod um, and kind of what brand and model is that? Yeah, I wish I would have um, brought that in. It's out, out in my car. It's a, a Siri um, and I don't remember the model number. Uh, they can, if they want the specific model number, ha they can either message me on Facebook through my photography page or send me an email. It's brian at brianhansel.com and I'll get them that model number. Um, maybe I'll put a review on my website for it too. Uh, and then I will be listing all of my photography gear that, that I brought on my last trip on Paddling Light. And uh, that will probably be next week when that, then that happens. But um, yeah, it's a brand new one by that company that just came out this year. So I don't remember the model number. And then I'm using an old ball head that I had um, from years back. And all together, it's a, it comes to three pounds and it's very small. It actually fits inside like a Cook Custom Sewing Explorer pack. Uh, so you don't have to carry it on a, the outside of your pack. You can put it on the inside and that pack, you know, is, is tall enough to handle it. I, I would assume other Portage packs are as well. But I know specifically that that one works because I just did it, just used it that way. Great. Yeah. And to just to that point about people wanting to follow up, um, everyone should have my email that has like the registration link and stuff. So if anyone wants to, um, you know, send me questions, I can forward those to Brian or link to, um, to Brian's website as well. Um, Jenny is wondering what your aperture set is at um, during the kind of near far photos. So I think if, if that makes sense to you. Yep. Yeah. So let me go back a couple slides. Um, yeah, we're still on the screen share here. So we'll just get to like a near far. Um, and we'll do a near, near far landscape shot. So we'll just have to go back a little further. So this one. Uh, so the way that you would shoot this aperture wise is like F11 to F16. And then the other thing you want to do is focus like right about where that laser pointer is. And when you do that, you'll get everything from the foreground. You can notice, uh, you know, even the, even the, um, is that arrow root? Can't quite tell. Uh, and the canoe logo is in focus. And then when you look back into the background, everything ends up in focus, but that's F11 to F16. Pro I usually shoot like on my lens, F14 is pretty sharp, F13 or 14 is pretty sharp. So that's usually where I'm doing it. And then I would focus right here on this bottom third line. So, you know, if you take a line and draw it right across anywhere on that line works to get everything in focus. Great, okay, thanks. Um, let's see. I see somebody is asking, um, when you mentioned night photos, you said you use a full frame camera. Can you explain or give more examples of what these full frame cameras are? Yeah, so a full frame camera just has a sensor that's the same size as a piece of 35 millimeter film. Um, so they're generally going to be the more expensive kind of cameras. Uh, a crop sensor camera is what digital originally started with, just because um, the, it's a lot less expensive. But they're they're smaller, and because they're smaller, they they don't have as much quality as a full frame. So like in the Nikon system, the full frames would be like a Z5, Z6, Z7 uh, cameras. In Sony, it would be like their um, a7 series, uh, A7R series, A1 series, uh, Z9, those are all full frame cameras. And like crop cameras in Nikon would be like a Z50 and in Sony it would be like the A6000 series. Um, and yeah, just a reminder for folks asking that all of these tips that Brian is saying will, um, will be recorded and we'll post this 
um, to our YouTube and send you a link um, later on this week. So you don't have to um, feel like you're, you're missing if you're not writing it down or something right now. Um, you'll be able to, to go back and look at that. Um, Taylor is wondering if you have any tips for changing lenses in a canoe um, and you know keeping everything safe and dry and not scratched. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, for me, it's just kind of like I would change anywhere. You know, uh, most of the time I'm photographing, even when I'm not in a canoe or kayak, it's generally near water, even near, either near a stream or on one of the Great Lakes or the ocean or whatever. So there's always kind of water around me. Um, what I like to do is take the lens and put it on the floor of the canoe if it's dry enough. If not, I'll, I'll hold it in my lap uh, between the legs or something, or just leave it in that uh, watershed bag. I take the top off the lens, um, then I point the camera downwards, remove the lens from the camera, set that somewhere secure and just take the other lens and pop it in. Um, but I always want the sensor and the opening of the camera facing downward. Uh, that way it's less likely that dust will land on the sensor. And dust in, in the boundary waters, you wouldn't think there's a lot, but there's a lot. Your, your sensor can get very dirty, um, even in a canoe, just from the dust blowing in it. So yeah, downward facing, get that lens ready that you're gonna put on your camera first, and then make sure you have a nice secure spot to put the lens you're taking off your camera um, and make that change as quick as you can. So just a few seconds if you can do it. Practicing at home um, to get your lens changes down fast helps a lot in the field. Great. Yeah, I know that that's a lot of, a lot of folks are kind of talking about considering, yeah, keeping it clean and, um, things like that. I know Tom is just asking, do you use cloth only when cleaning lenses on a DSLR? <laughs> um, so I got a little story about this. So, so we're at a public meeting and I'm there reporting for, um, I forget what paddling magazine it was. And then Kevin Jacobson, who was, uh, Northland news center at the time, he's there reporting for, for their channel. He has like this uh, twenty thirty thousand dollar Leica video camera, and I have a really high end digital SLR at the time. And I just take the cloth from my wrist um, on my my shirt, and I start wiping the front of my lens off. And there's another photographer. He's like, "Oh, that's how the pros do it." And then Kevin does the same thing on his twenty thousand dollar camera. <laughs> and we're just, yeah. I mean, ideally, if you're using a cloth, it wants to be a microfiber cloth, but that doesn't stop me from using my shirt every now and then. Uh, what I do like to carry with me is this thing called a lens pen. It's about ten bucks. And there, it has a, a brush on one side and then a special cleaning element on the others. And it works really well. Uh, it fits in your pocket. It's like the size of a pen. Um, but I, I would highly recommend getting one of those. Great. Well, that is super helpful. I see we still have a bunch of questions left, but we are um, running up at the end of the hour. So I will just suggest to folks, if you have questions that didn't get answered, um, feel free to email me or to email Brian directly and we can try to get those answered for you. I know Brian has a lot of great resources on his website too that, that might help you answer some of these questions as well. Um, so thank you so much, Brian, for a great presentation. This was really helpful. I think a lot of folks learned a lot and were really engaged. So really appreciate you coming and, and presenting here. Um, I'll encourage everybody to visit Brian's website and also visit our Friends of the Boundary Waters website. Both have a lot of great resources for your trips, for your photography, um, and you know, places to learn a lot more. So thank you all for joining. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Get some paddling in this summer.